Welcome to Breaking the Set. I'm Abby Martin. Earlier this month, the BTS team had the opportunity to visit Cuba. And over the next three days, we'll be exploring different underreported aspects of Cuban society and culture. See, when Obama made the announcement to normalize relations with the small island, many saw it as a historic shift in policy between two countries that have been at odds for more than 50 years. But those who were born after the Cold War may not understand the roots of this tension and why there's still such a long road ahead to make up for the years of isolation and aggression. So first, let's go back to the Cuban Revolution. Once a Spanish colony in the first half of the 20th century, Cuba was fast becoming just another appendage of the United States. With corporate interests firmly secured in the country, Western-backed dictator Fulgencio Batista carried out a military coup in 1952. Seven years later, in 1959, guerrilla fighters Fidel Castro and Che Guevara led a 9,000-strong army, forcing Batista into exile. The revolution marked the first successful revolt against neocolonialism in history. The new communist government was at odds with the U.S. and demanded Guantanamo Bay be returned, calling it a violation of international law and an occupation of a sovereign land. The U.S. government refused. It was the height of the Cold War, and Cuba's communist revolution prompted Kennedy to impose an embargo and launch the infamous Bay of Pigs operation, a failed regime change attempt in 1961. Top government officials wanted Castro gone so badly that the next year it even drafted plans to kill innocent people and commit acts of terrorism in U.S. cities to create public support for a war against Cuba. Yet it never carried out the operation. Fearing another U.S. invasion, Cuba asked to host nuclear missiles from the Soviet Union, launching the global hysteria known as the Cuban Missile Crisis, a standoff between the Soviet Union, Cuba, and the U.S., putting the world on the brink of nuclear war. The tense relationship escalated one step further in 1982, when the State Department placed Cuba on the state sponsors of terrorism list, citing its support for international terrorism and revolutionary groups in Spain and Latin America. And it remains on the list today, alongside only three other countries in the world, Iran, Sudan, and Syria. Ironic, considering how Cuba has suffered more terrorist acts against it than any other country. According to Cuba expert and author Salim Lamrani, between 1959 and 1997, the U.S. carried out 5,780 covert actions in Cuba, including several bombings that left thousands of people dead. After several anti-communist terrorist attacks were carried out in Havana with connections to the CIA and exile groups in Miami, Florida, five Cuban intelligence officers were sent to gather intel on the community. In 1998, the five men were charged with conspiracy and three sentenced to life in prison, becoming an emblematic symbol of Western hypocrisy in Cuba. The remaining members of the group still in prison were recently freed as part of the normalization process. And after a whopping 638 unsuccessful assassination attempts against Fidel Castro during his 50-year reign, his brother Raul took his place in 2008. University of Havana history professor Jesus Arbolea Cervera explains how unacceptable this historic policy has been for the Cuban people. It's different to, to explain to one, to American people is that the United States don't have the right to do that. Why are they No doing here, it? no here and not ever, any, any, anywhere, you know. What we want is not what the United States wants. And really, the United States don't have a, a normal relation with anyone in the world. You know. It's, it's a, a, a dominant relation, a hegemonic a, a relation with the rest of the world. So we have a, 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 very, a, 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 a very big confrontation with the United States for many things. Not just, it's not just a, an ideological problem. It's a life problem. It's a way of life. And that way of life couldn't be more at odds still today, where the U.S. government spends 20 million taxpayer dollars on the ground in Cuba to carry out regime change through subversive USAID programs. So while the world celebrates the end over 50 years of Cold War hostility, 
This tenuous history proves there's still a long way to go before the U.S.-Cuban relationship is ever considered normal. On Friday, Cuban and U.S. diplomats will meet in Washington for the second round of diplomatic talks. But in order to understand just what's at stake here, it's necessary to delve into the most contentious issues at the heart of the negotiations. Starting with Cuba being on the U.S.'s state sponsor of terrorism list. According to the State Department, this designation is because Cuba provides safe haven for members of ETA, the Basque separatist group in Spain, and Colombian guerrilla organization FARC. But inexplicably, its own report on Cuba notes Cuba's ties to ETA have become more distant, and that about eight of the two dozen ETA members in Cuba were relocated with the cooperation of the Spanish government. Furthermore, there was no indication that the Cuban government provided weapons or paramilitary training to terrorist groups. But even if Cuba is removed from the list, it will have no impact on the crippling embargo. See, legislation like the Cuban Democracy Act prohibits even foreign subsidiaries of U.S. corporations from trading with the island nation. As a result, Cuba calls the embargo a blockade because it not only prevents American goods from reaching the country, but from any company in the world with ties to U.S. business. And because of this, Cuba is largely caught in a time warp and must rely on 1950s cars and ancient appliances for its technology needs not to mention the difficulties procuring everything from construction materials to telecommunications networks. It's this purposeful stunting of Cuba's economic growth that has led every single UN member state to symbolically vote against the embargo, with the exception of the US and Israel. Beyond the embargo, though, one of the more pointless disputes is the U.S.'s claim that Cuba owes six to seven billion dollars to business owners that lost their companies when the country nationalized them. While Cuba has acknowledged this, the economically distraught nation has zero way of actually paying back the U.S. If reparations are on the table, the U.S. owes Cuba as much as 181 billion as a result of the embargo. And of course, there's Guantanamo Bay. The territory Cuba cheaply leased the U.S. back in 1903 under the auspices it was going to be used for mining and coal operations, not torture and indefinite detention. Raul Castro made it crystal clear that diplomatic reapproachment with the U.S. wouldn't make any sense without the return of Gitmo. But Roberta Jacobson, the U.S. government official leading the negotiations, said Gitmo is off limits. Then there's the so-called democracy programs. Obama has stated the strategy of isolation isn't working, but he's refused to end the quote pro-democracy programs the U.S. has been employing in Cuba for decades to the tune of 20 million dollars a year during the current talks. Over the years, the U.S. has employed frequent subversive political campaigns under the guise of aid. According to the Government Accountability Office, typical program beneficiaries include Cuban community leaders, independent journalists, women, youths, and other marginalized groups. Just in the last five years, USAID has also built a secret Twitter campaign designed to undermine the government, paid young Latin Americans nearly $6 an hour to stir dissent under the umbrella of HIV prevention, and even tried to co-opt the country's underground hip-hop scene a movement already very critical of the Castro government. Then there's the question of political prisoners. Since there's no extradition treaty between Cuba and the U.S., an estimated 70 American fugitives are currently living on the island, including Asada Shakur, the first woman to be placed on the FBI's most wanted terrorist list. Shakur is a Black Panther sentenced to life in jail for killing a New Jersey cop. However, there's contradictory evidence regarding her guilt. And since escaping prison, she's lived in Cuba under asylum since 1984. Josefina Fidel, Fidel, excuse me, Cuba's head of North American Affairs, maintains that Cuba has every right to grant legitimate political asylum to people it considers persecuted. 
We've reminded the U.S. government that in the country they've given shelter to dozens and dozens of Cuban citizens, some of them accused of horrible crimes, some accused of terrorism, murder, and kidnapping. And in every case, the U.S. government has decided to welcome them. She's right. Perhaps the most absurd example of all being Luis Posada Carriles, a former CIA asset who was involved in the bombing of a Cuban airliner that killed 73 people. Carriles has been freely living in the U.S. since 2005. Lastly, with many Cubans attempting the dangerous 90-mile journey to America, U.S. immigration policy must be revamped. See, despite rabid GOP fear-mongering about immigration, there isn't much outcry about the special wet foot, dry foot status given exclusively to Cuban immigrants. The Cuban Adjustment Act encourages Cubans to emigrate to the U.S., offering them a fast track to citizenship. Cuba has repeatedly cited that the Cuban Adjustment Act violates immigration agreements signed by both countries. So far, Congress has not touched the law because of the widespread support it has from Cuban Americans living in Florida, a base too strong to ostracize. So despite the recent encouraging moves, we mustn't forget the many, many obstacles standing in the way of mutual respect. While the recent thaw in U.S.-Cuban relations has emanated from the highest levels of government, for decades it's been peace activists who have shunned government restrictions and laid the groundwork for high-level diplomacy. And earlier this month, a female-led activist organization called Code Pink did just that. Breaking the set producer Cody Snell has the story. For over 12 years, the grassroots organization of peace activists known as Code Pink has shaken up the Washington establishment with countless anti-war demonstrations in front of DC's top politicians and policymakers. Would you please leave? Would you please leave the room now? We're asking you nicely. But this month, 150 members and supporters of the group took their message of peace and diplomacy to an island nation that's been at odds with the US for over 50 years. The Code Pink delegation is the largest group of American peace activists to visit Cuba since the two countries announced the start of normalized relations. And their reasons for coming here are as diverse as the activists themselves. I've always been curious about this country. I've heard a lot about it from a government that I increasingly distrust in the United States and the opportunity to see through the spin, see through the PR, and actually, with my own eyes, uh, get a better sense of the issues here on the ground. I came um, on this trip to Cuba to, uh, one, stand in solidarity with Cuba. They were. Uh, very adamant about speaking out against um, U.S. policies, against the militarization of the police. Here, and teachers are seen as heroes, and I just thought that that was just so inspiring to me, and um, I just, I just, <laughs> I just want to bring that energy back to to my school. We want to say that it's absolutely ridiculous that Cuba is on the terrorist list. That Cuba is exporting doctors and teachers, not uh, terrorists. Uh, we want to go back and say that we should be able to travel here, just like people all over the world come here. Over the course of the eight-day trip, the delegation had the chance to meet with the international press, question high-level Cuban government officials, and visit everywhere from the country's top medical schools to agricultural co-ops. But this historic trip was hardly just an educational experience, as select members of Code Pink were granted a meeting with diplomats at the U.S. interest section in Havana to discuss their biggest concerns with regards to U.S. policy towards the island nation. We were raising all of these issues about the Guantanamo prison that needs to be, for the national security of the United States, that thing needs to be closed. Well, my question at the intersection was, why are they only allowing imports to the United States from private businesses when here's a country where the state gives you free health care and free education? And while the changes that the group is demanding can ultimately only be decided at the highest levels of government, organizers of the trip say that grassroots diplomacy is putting real pressure on policymakers to finally end the decades-old blockade once and for all. If it's the blockade is finally left, we're going to first of all celebrate because here in Cuba we like to celebrate victories. And if, if, it's, if it is, if after 50 years, 56 years, we can have a big party and we can have a party with Americans and Cubans together. 
From Havana, Cuba, this is Cody Snow for Breaking the Set. Coming up, more of our exclusive coverage from Cuba. You know that guy who wishes someone would spy on him? How about the woman who enjoys being lied to by her government? This citizen can't get enough congressional inaction. And this taxpayer wants the mainstream media to be more corporatized. While this person would rather eat genetically modified food, this one thinks our prisons are not crowded enough. And what do these people have in common? They don't exist. While in Cuba, we wanted to speak with the people that will be most impacted by the establishment of normalized relations with the U.S. But we also wanted to compare those responses to the Cuban exile community living in Miami. And here's what they had to say. I have a lot of friends who live in the United States and will like to come to Cuba, but they cannot. Also, the blockade affects the import of medicine and the economy. Some people need specific medicines that you can only acquire in the U.S. market. And with the blockade, they prevent medicines to come here. And even kids have died. The blockade was invented by Fidel Castro to maintain his power forever. In Cuba, there doesn't exist any type of blockade. There are different kind of blockades, external blockades and internal ones. They all affect the options that you have when it comes to choice. Cuba has always been against terrorism. Cuba doesn't like terrorism. I don't know why the United States insists on having us on that list. Personally, I feel very insulted because I am a father. I was in an international mission in Angola for 27 months, and I'm proud of having done that. I went there without receiving a single penny, under the risk of being killed just for international solidarity. And they say that Cuba sponsored terrorism? It's ridiculous. The U.S. knows perfectly well that we do not sponsor terrorism. It's part of a policy to try to influence other countries that are getting closer to us. It's like a joke having this policy against us when we have fought terrorism a lot. Even during the time of the revolution, terrorism has never been practiced here. Everything humans do is subject to improvement. There is no perfect human deed. As expected, our authorities and the party have been looking for a path to a better future. One much better than capitalism, I would say. I would like to have democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of everything, because in Cuba there is no freedom of speech. Things always have to change. If you don't change, you get isolated from the world. We have to change for the better, as long as they don't take from us what we've achieved. Only 25% of Cuban citizens have access to the Internet. And it's stats like these that have given Americans the impression that Cuba is a totalitarian state with little freedom of speech. So to get some answers from Cuba's top government officials about the state of press and internet freedom, I spoke with high-ranking parliament member Kenya Serrano. Check it out. Common criticism in the United States is that Cuba only has one party. So how can you ensure democratic participation with one party? The Communist Party of Cuba is very democratic. Of course, the party represents the vanguard of the Cuban people, but we have many, many spaces for the public debate. For instance, for the updating of the Cuban economic model, we have a huge debate of about 8 million persons 
contributed with their opinions and we have very good results because more than 68 percent of the proposals presented as a draft at the beginning of the public debate were changed so we have a better a platform today for the updating of the cuban economic model so in my view it is a very good example of how we promote and how the Communist Party of Cuba is the main one promoting public debate, democratic debate, and our model of participation has a very beautiful name. It is people's power. So we believe that in our conditions, remember that Cuba is blockaded, that Cuba is an island, so we need to preserve this uh, political system and probably in the future it is better. But for now, it is good, it is functioning, and it is solving our uh, problems in terms of public participation. And how often are people elected from local municipalities? First of all, the Communist Party of Cuba do not uh, contribute to present candidates. It is not a, an electoral party. Our party, yes, is the vanguard of the society, but in the electoral process, it is the citizenship, it is the people, the civil and social organizations, women's federation, students' federation, the trade union movement, the farmers and other uh, social and civil institutions, the ones that present the candidates. And then thousands of Cubans are presented at the local, province and national level, and it is how we organize the electoral process. Now, next April the 19th, we will be, we will be having middle-term elections in Cuba for municipal and province levels. Kenya, it seems like almost every day in the Western media we hear about dissidents or defectors speaking out against the government for lack of freedom of the internet, freedom of press. Um, why do you think that is? If you look to the very high literacy rate that Cuba has, you could be sure that we have a very high cultural level in our population. And also we have the right to think by ourselves, to make decisions by ourselves. It is the main antidote against misinformation, against brainwashing. So uh, yes, in Cuba we have people that they are not uh, in agreement with the opinions and the positions of the party, of the positions with the government, but those that are very much publicized by the US media, they are in fact, they are cyber mercenaries. They receive very good salaries. Their blogs and Twitter connections and internet connections are very well financed by the US, exactly by the US aid, that agency that is in charge of all this espionage and all these uh, subversion plans, what they call regime change programs in the US. So. In Cuba, you could have different opinions. In Cuba, you could criticize the government. In Cuba, you could be opposed to the government. But the problem is that in Cuba, if you are receiving a salary in order to represent the views and opinions of the historical enemy of Cuba, you cannot consider yourself a dissident. You are a mercenary. So it is the difference that we always make about this situation. But of course, in the present and in the future, we will have a society more able to debate, but currently in Cuba, we have a very huge, interesting, interactive debate promoted by ourselves, and it is one of the reasons why we say that our model could be updated. It could be updated because it could be more democratic, because it could be more participative, it could be more open to people's proposals, and it is what we are doing, but with our own efforts, without any foreign inter inter interference and without any orders coming from the states or from any other uh, power. We are able to decide. We are empowered to decide because we conquered independence and sovereignty back in 1959. And it is part of our resistance. It is part of our struggle for peace, for independence, and also for our continuous solidarity and internationalism with many peoples of the world. And once the blockade is lifted, how does the government plan on expanding internet access for all Cubans? We are very interesting, and in fact, since 1982, 
we started to develop, for instance, the biotech industry. Remember a country, a blockaded country here in the Caribbean island, but thinking in the future, back in 1982, we started that industry. So it is a, a, a real fact to say that there is the political willingness to develop the new technologies in Cuba. In fact, we invest a lot but it is a very expensive uh, industry. And currently, uh, we have 25% of our population is able to be connected to different sources through, mainly through social institutions. We are given priority in our uh, policy uh, in our uh, internet developing policy, we are giving priority to the social and research institutions, to the journalists, to the intellectuals, and also in the future. And we have some people uh, individually connected at home, but in fact, our priority as a poor country, as a developing country, is to invest more in the infrastructure in order to have social facility and social access to internet for millions of Cubans. It is not going to be the market, the one telling us what to do with internet. In the case of Cuba, we are a socialist country and we consider in parliament that the way to do that is not just to allow those having more money to have more internet access. That's not fair. It is a, a country where we have the, the, the human being is the cornerstone of our process. How come to allow that uh, inequalities to, to, to happen in terms of internet connection? So it is the way that we are doing things, but the main, the main obstacle continues being the U.S. blockade against Cuba. So the day that the blockade is lifted, yes, we consider we will have more access to new technologies but remember some technologies are run by the US they are in uh, Texas they are in many areas in the states they have Google they have all that control so we are participating in a debate about technological sovereignty so Cuba is very, very concerned about, not only about our sovereignty, but also about the, the food sovereignty, about the technological sovereignty. And we are developing open sources in order not to depend on Google and many other transnationals that are controlled by the US. Thank you so much, Kenya. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you. And thanks for watching. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at Abby Martin. Join me tomorrow when I break the set from Cuba all over again.